So let's do this. And let's start talking about functions. Functions are a new way of uh, using of reusing code. Uh, so far, we've had the basics. We've also learned about uh, blocks, code blocks, with local and global scope. And so we've been able to, what last week when we did loops, we've been able to create a block of code and reuse that block of code as many times as we need to in a loop. Well, this week, we get to do that, but we get to name it. So we can take code and group it into something called a function and just reuse that and call that function whenever we need to with different data. So more reusability, my favorite subject. Um, and this is our second four -way foray. And again, we're not copying and pasting code. And why is this my favorite subject? More importantly, why is it important? Because we are reducing the amount of code we have to write and maintain. If we develop our code in a structured, reusable manner, we end up writing less code. And when you are a professional developer, that's important. You don't want to write a lot of extra code because you're going to have to maintain a lot of extra code. I'm in the process of um, updating something that someone else did in early 2003, and there's a lot of redundant code in there that I'm having to refactor so that you don't have as much code. Um, and, and it's not an easy task to refactor someone else's code. So if you can write, you, you really do want to write the minimum amount of code to get done what has to get done. Um, so, and this week we're going to learn to write that minimum amount of code and we're going to get to name it and do a few other things with it. So we got a couple new keywords. We have the keyword def, which tells Python that we are defining a function. And we have the keyword return, which tells Python to return a value from a function. So let's say we did this great, wonderful calculation in our function, and we need to get that back into, let's say, the global scope. The return keyword will do that for us. And we've got some new concepts this week. We have the concept of an argument, a parameter, and the concept of a function call. So an argument is a value passed into a function through the function call, and it's usually through a variable. So you'll put a variable as an argument in a function call. We've done this before with print. You can print out the value of a variable using the print function. So it's the same thing. Whatever variable you're trying to print, that is an argument into the print function. Parameter. It's a placeholder in the function definition, and it basically is like a, defining a local variable for the function, and it creates a placeholder so you can receive information into the function so that you can use the local block of that function to do whatever calculations you need. And a function call is the concept of activating the function. Because what we're going to see here this week is that we um, are going to define a function, and it's not going to be used right away. Python will literally skip over the whole function when you're running the program, and it won't actually attempt to execute any of the code in the, in the local scope of the function until you've called the function. So we'll go through that, and I'll do some examples, several examples in PyCharm that show you what I mean by that. So what is a function? A function is a named group of code that has a specific purpose. What's the purpose? It can be anything. It's whatever you want it to be. Um, this is more data-driven coding. Last week, we, we saw how the outcome 
of a loop could change based on the data that was going through the loop at any given iteration. Well, this week, we're going to change potentially the outcome of the function, whatever the process in the function does, because we're going to be giving it different data. Um, and functions are a means of grouping codes. So let's look at a function definition. Now, if you want to follow along through Zybooks, this is challenge 511, and it says it wants to print five characters twice. So first thing I have in my Python script is I have this thing called a function definition. The f I always start off every function definition with the keyword def. It tells Python to register this function for later use. It's like putting it into a library. And then I have the function name, and this has to be unique to all other function names in my program. And the naming conventions are basically the same as variable naming conventions. Then I have an open and closing parenthesis. Now, at, at minimum, it's an open and closing parenthesis. There may be more stuff in those parentheses, and we're going to talk about that later. But for right now, you have to have the opening and closing parentheses, and you have to end it with a colon. Just like everything else is going to have a local scope, you've got to end that thing with a colon. And then, and the um, what's inside the parentheses will be any it, it, it will be uh, data, if any, that's going to be passed in. And the next line, immediately the next line down, has to be the local scope of the function. So we know it's a local scope because it's indented by at least one tab stop from the function definition. Um, this is called a code block, and it will only be executed when the print pattern is called. So this is like a library, um, and, and you're just putting this code away for further use. A couple of rules. A function declaration is started with the keyword def, always. A function declaration must end with a colon, always. And a function requires opening and closing parentheses, always. Calling a function. So now I have the function that I defined in the last slide. And now I want to call the function. Well, I call the function by simply using the function name and open and closing parentheses. If it were necessary, there would be something in the parentheses, but there doesn't have to be right now. And what will happen is whatever is inside that function will be executed. Whatever lines of code will be executed in this function. Now, this print pattern is, you know, it's like, well, why in the world would you define a function called print pattern that only prints out five stars? That's just because we're talking about um, the basics right now. We'll get a little bit more into more complex functions later, and you've got some pretty complex ones to write for your labs this week. So the function call itself is simply the name of the function, an open parenthesis, any variables that need to go in, and a closing parenthesis. And I can call it as many times as I want. Now, a couple of rules. A function has to be defined before it can be called. So def print pattern has to be defined above where it's called, period. Um, you call a function using its name, and a function called Python tells Python to run the code inside the function definition. So let us go and just see what I mean. So here's 5.1.1, and I've got four lines in print pattern, but um, edit configuration, that's not what I want. There's project 5, where are you? 5.1.1, okay. 
So I have a function called print pattern right here. Now I've just added a couple extra lines. And um, I want to use it to print out stars. So what I'm going to do, as always, is I'm going to go into the debugger. And you will see, OK, I have a breakpoint set at line 3. I have a breakpoint set at line 7. PyCharm did not stop at line 3. That's because PyCharm doesn't care about line 3 at this point. It said, OK, I've now got something called print pattern. And I know print pattern runs from line 3 to line 5. I know there's no syntax errors, or I wouldn't be running. So then it's going to go to the next um, line in the global scope. For us, we're going to have local scope and global scope. There's not going to be any real machinations about that. And so the first place it stops is on line 7, where I'm calling print pattern. So. I also want to direct you down here where my mouse is. Sorry, I didn't mean to step over. But I'll show you to step into it in a second. So I stepped over, and now I'm on line 3, which is inside the print pattern function. And I didn't, the way I did that was I simply called print pattern. So I'm going to step over this, and we'll see the console's getting, everything's getting printed out. And now, I'm going to step over line 7 because I'm done. Now I'm going to call print pattern again. So here's a little bit about the debugger. I can also get into a function by using the step into arrow. So we have step over, which I've been using a lot. And we have step into now, which allows you to step into a function if you don't have a breakpoint in it. And then there's step into my code, which for us, it's always going to be your code for the most part. And then step out if you just want to have it finish and step out of a function. So I'm just going to use step into. I then go to line 3. I'm going to print some lines. And then I'm done. So I just printed a bunch of stars. But that's what I mean by the fact that Python, as long as there's not a syntax error, doesn't care about that code until it is called. And in this case, the first time it's called is on line 7. Now, let's do a few things to break it. First of all, you'll see all the nice little red squigglies. And when I run this, I get indentation error, unexpected and indented block. That is because the first line after the definition has to be indented. So I go back here to get rid of my syntax error. Now, what if I do this? Well, actually, let's do this and this. I don't have any syntax errors. So let me do let let me now put a breakpoint on line four, and I'm going to debug this. Well, the first thing that shows up, the first breakpoint I hit is on line four. And I'm hitting it because this print statement is no longer inside the local scope of the print pattern function. Uh, because I moved it back a single indent, it, a single tab stop, it's in the global scope. This can be a logic error, and it's something to watch out for when you're programming. Because especially now that you're starting to do more functions and you're going to be doing loops and functions for your game, you have to make sure that your indentation is correct. Because if it's not, you could cause a logic error. You won't have any syntax problems, but you will, in fact, have logic problems if you don't get the indentation right. So let's keep going. So I talked a minute ago about the fact that you just had opening and closing parentheses, but you could put something inside them. Well, what you can put inside them are function parameters. Now, a parameter is simply a local variable placeholder, and it is local to the local scope of the function that it's defined in. 
So in this case, I have my def, my, my keyword to define a function. I have my function name. I have an opening parenthesis. And then inside of it, I have two variable names because that's what you're going to see for the most part, there's a little bit there's there's a little bit of change to that, but for the most part, you're going to see two you're going to see variable names. You can have one, you can have two, you can have any number that you want. A parameter has to be a valid variable name. So if you can't use it in a variable name, you can't use it in a parameter name. Um, and in this case we have two. Parameters are always separated by a comma. So it is a list of parameters, and those individual parameter values have to be separated by a comma. Um, and then inside, and then I have my closing parenthesis, sorry, and then a closing colon. So inside, in this case, I have two lines of code. I have total inches equal num feet times 12 plus inches. And then I have print total inches. So inside of this, I am using the value associated with the variable num feet. And I'm using the value associated with the variable num inches to do a calculation for total inches. And then I call the print function and I print it out. Um, Let's see, I already said that the parameter is a variable that exists inside the function. The value of the parameter is provided by the function call. So right now, for the definition, num feet and num inches have no value. That those values are assigned when you're calling the function. So if I look again at num at print total inches with my num feet and num inches. I sit here and I'm going to ask the professor for the num feet and num inches and I'm going to put in 5 and 8. So when I make the function call, 5 is going to be num feet in print total inches and 8 is going to be num inches. So 5 and 8 are then used in the calculation for 68. So what I have done is I have used variables num feet and num inches to pass two variables that were read in from the command line to my print total inches function and I've done a calculation. Now one thing to note here is that the, val the variable name of the argument has nothing to do with the parameter names. They could be I, I, this, this uh, the num feet that I uh, get from input could have as easily been x. So the names don't matter. It's the position. Arguments and parameters are only positionally associated. What I mean by that is first argument becomes the first parameter value. Second argument becomes the second parameter value. Um, and the function call has to have the same number of arguments as parameters in the function for the most part. There is um, a caveat to that which we'll get into in a bit, but for the most part the functions that you write in this class, if you write it to take to um, parameters, then you've got to call it using two arguments. They have to match. Okay, so now we're going to do this again because I'm going to talk about arguments in order, which I just brought up in the last slide, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it. So here I'm going to mess up num feet and num inches. So now I'm going to say num feet is 5 and num inches is 8. Now I've got num inches comma num feet. So num 5 is going to go and be, the value 5 is going to be placed in the num inches variable. And 8 is going to be placed in the num feet variable and I get 101. So my calculation changes when I change the order of the arguments that I'm using to call the function. Um, so names don't matter, order does. They're all 
every argument is positional. Um, functions and return. So we have this new keyword called return. A return is pretty much only used in a function. In this case, I have a function called pyramid volume. It's for challenge 533. And I've got three arguments in that, base length, base width, pyramid height. And I'm going to do a calculation for the pyramid using those. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this new keyword return to, re for, to get that calculation out of that function. Because in the local scope, that's all it is. I can't get it, I, I can't use that uh, variable pyramid that's in my little script here in the global scope. It won't work. It simply won't be there. What I can do, however, is I can return the value that is associated with the variable called pyramid. And then Python will take whatever that value is, and it'll make it available to me in the outer scope, or for us in the global scope. Um, and its return is used exclusively inside functions. So let us, um, I'm going to go, and I'm going to, I think it gets easier sometimes. Which one am I at? Uh, here we are. We're just going to run through this one, not on the slide as much, but here so we can see what's going on. So, um, and actually, rather than having to watch me type in things, let's see. Um, Nope, okay. So I thought, well, never mind. We're just going to do it like this. So 2.2, 3.3. I could have just, as I usually had already put them in by now. But anyway, what I have here is I have a script. I have my, I'm going to, in my def pyramid volume function, I'm going to calculate the pyramid volume. Then I'm going to return it, and I'm going to print it out. So let's see what happens. I've got a breakpoint set on line 14. I am going to edit my configuration. Three point three three. That was the right one. I'm going to set the debugger going. So I am, I'm about to call my pyramid volume. So let's see what happens because I have length, which is 2.2, width, which is 3.3, and height, which is 4.4. And oh, by the way, one of the nice things in PyCharm, if you mouse over a variable, it will tell you it's value and its type. I can also go down here in the debugger and take a look at what they are. So I'm going to step into 7. So I can see here also in PyCharm that my local variable base length is 2.2, base width is 3.3, and, and pyramid height is 4.4. You will notice that these are different names. This is base length. This is length. The name has no bearing. It's all positional. So now I am going to step over this. I have created my value pyramid. And it's 10.648. Now I want to be able to use that in the global scope to print something. I want to be able to print XXX. So what do I do to do that? Well, I use the return statement. So when I step over this, I can look now, and I have XXX, which is the value, sorry, XXX, which is the value I calculated in the function. And I can then go ahead and print it out. 
and the volume for 2.2, 2, 2, 2, 3.3, and 4.4 is 10.648. So that is what the return is used for. It allows you to take a value out of a function. And it actually, one of the nice things about Python is, is um, and it's different than a lot of languages because you can do what's called a multi-return. And you're going to have to do that for one of your labs this week. And we'll talk, we will go over that. So that's basically what this slide was going to say. But I thought it would be easier to go over in PyCharm. Um, oh, here's the other thing I want to show you. So if for some reason, because I said this value is not, is not usable. So if I said print, print pyramid here, I get red squiggly. Even though I've got the word pyramid here, Python is telling me on line 9 that it doesn't know what that is. And if I decided to try and run it, I would get error name pyramid is not defined. Now, that's because it is not defined in the global scope. Pyramid is only defined in the local scope. So the way you get the value of pyramid out of the pyramid volume function is to do the return. So that was the other thing I wanted to show you was that Pyramid really isn't available in any other scope other than the uh, local scope of the function. Okay, and I know I'm saying local scope and global scope, but that's really what a lot of this stuff is about. It's understanding what scope you're in so that you can, and here we go with scope again, um, it's understanding what scope you're in so that you can know when a variable is defined and when a variable is not defined and when, it's, when you can use it and when you can't and how to get information into a local scope of a function. Now, by the way, one of the things I haven't said yet is that, um, oh, this is all the stuff I was going to say anyway. One of the things that I haven't said yet, and now I can't remember, I'm sorry. So this is actually all of the stuff that I just said about local and global scopes for the function. So we'll just let this one run through and then go on to the next one. Because return makes the data available to the local scope. We've got, I don't know why I said retail, but retail has the, the value of the return. So function arguments and mutability. What we're talking about here is that, well, first of all, certain things in uh, Python are objects. Lists are considered to be objects. If you pass in an object to, as opposed to just a straight value. So if I pass in number one, that's not really an object, that's an integer. If I pass in a list, I'm passing in an object. So I will be passing in a reference to that object. I will not be passing in the, a, a copy of the list. And what that means is that sometimes I don't have to return things. And I don't have to return things because if I send in a mutable object like a list and I modify that list internally in the function, then I don't actually have to return it. The, the Python, because it's always pointing to that one place in computer memory where that list is, it's just going to change it in computer memory and it will be available to me. Now, there's nothing to stop you 
from returning it. You can always return it. And sometimes if you're unsure, it's better to return it. But that's what we mean by function arguments and mutability. It's a subject I wanted to touch on. You're not going to have to do much with it in this class because you're not really going to be changing and swapping values or anything like that for mutable um, for mutable objects. So I said a little bit ago that um, you always have to have the same number of arguments as you have parameters mostly. Now we find out what the mostly is about. So what's happening here is I have something called a default parameter value. A default parameter value is a parameter that has a default value. And the way I define this for Python is in the function definition, I can say a variable, uh, sorry, a parameter followed by an equal sign followed by a value. And that will become the default parameter for, sorry, default value for that parameter. Now there are a couple of rules that you have to follow here. One of them is that all parameters with default values have to come after parameters without default values. Now what is the advantage of having a default value? Well, the advantage of having a default value is that if I'm calling this function, I don't have to call it with as many arguments as there are parameters. I can call it with, um, with only the arguments that don't have uh, default, argu uh, only enough arguments for the parameters that do not have default values. So like with print, you can say print, and then you can give a string and a comma and an end equal whatever. That is because the print function has, as a de has, a, has an argument called end, and its default value is a new line. So we've been using this concept all along. We just haven't known about it. Um, Let's see. I think I've said everything I need to. OK. Multi-returns. So um, one of the things that you can do in Python that you can't do in a lot of languages is you can return more than one value from a function. Even in Java, C, C++, if you have a function, you can return a single value. So if you have multiple values that you want to return, you have to define a structure, some structure to put all those things in. So you only return one thing. In Python, you can return multiple things. And that's very handy. It's very, very handy, actually. Now, um, and you're going to need to do this for one of your labs, and we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm try if I'm going too fast, let me know. I'm trying, um, okay, I am trying not to go over like I did last week. So for this, what I have is I have a function called move it. And this is a standard way to swap things. In, in any language. You take in two arguments, and then on the inside of a swap function, you're going to have a temporary variable that you create. You're going to put the first thing, the first parameter into that variable. And then you're going to uh, take, oh, I see. This is a second element from a list to a second list. My, my apologies. This is kind of like a swap function. It is a swap function. But in this case, we have list values. So what we've got here is we've got two lists. We've got a list called 1, 2, 3, and a list called 4, 5, 6. And what I want to do is I want to, what this is saying, do it take L, the second element from, the first, from list 1 and move it, the second element, to list 2 and from list 2 to list 1. 
So what I've done here is I've passed in two lists and I've created a temp and I've gotten the um, second element from list one, I've put it into that temp value. Then I have taken the second element from list two and I've put it into the second element of list one and then I've taken list one and I've added um, and I put the temp in the uh, ah that was wrong sorry I just saw that list two and one and then I put the temp variable into the second element of the second list and then what I get back is I can get back both lists now I don't have to get back both lists because I just told you they're mutable but in this case for the example we're going to return two different lists and I'm going to print those lists out and you will see that R1 which is list 1 is 1 5 and 3 and R2 which is list 2 is 4 2 and 6 so returning is positional just like arguments and parameters are positional so when I return list 1 comma list 2 I am going to be filling out I'm going to be assigning a value to R2 which would be the values that are in list 1 and sorry R1 which are the values in list 1 and R2 which are the values in list 2 and this is important because you're going to want to do this with um, your coin problem you're going to need to write a function for the coin problem and then you're going to have to return quarters dimes nickels yeah sorry dollars quarters dimes nickels and pennies okay so now we have we have our labs well let me go back and see are there any of these other ones that I want to go through um just in case I didn't say it you can put anything in a function that you've that we've done so far you can do lists you can do if statements you can do any of that um let's see I don't think so so this is the one that we're swapping the list one um, we're swapping two lists I think that's okay okay so let us go sorry let us talk about the labs this week so lab 5.18 you're going to want to swap some things okay and you're going to want to not only swap them but you're going to want to return both things that you have to swap so I'm going to define a function called swap it's going to take two parameters just like I did with the one I was showing you with the temp and the list this isn't for a list so you just have to have a temporary variable that you're going to assign to the value of the first parameter you're going to assign the, the first parameter to the value of the second you're going to assign the value of the second parameter to the value of temp and then you're going to return parameter one and parameter two and remember to have two variables on the left hand side of a single equal sign which is what can be confusing to some people about the multi return because you have a single equal sign and up until this time in the class you've only ever had one variable to the left hand side of a single equal sign the exception to that now is that you can have multiple variables to the left hand side of a single equal sign if they are associated with a function that returns multiple values so it's it's an expansion of what we have done up till this point and then of course you're going to output them so we're going to now do the exact change now we've done this before 
almost exactly. We just have to now create a function out of part of it. So what we have is in module three, you had to do the exact change with the floor calculation. Start with that. Okay, don't try and rewrite lab 5.19 from scratch. Go to module three, as long as you did it well, copy and paste it. And then what you want to do is you want to take the calculations and you want to create a function from those calculations. So you're going to want to create a function with the name of exact change and it's going to take one variable, uh, sorry, one, one parameter and that parameter is from the user input. Somebody's going to put in a, an amount and the concept is the same, the calculations are the same. You're going to want to find the number of dollars that they have, the number of quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And then in this function, you're going to want to return dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies to the calling function. So if you got this even close to right, it's now time to get it more right and turn it into a function. And the second part of that is what is the remainder of the um, of the project of, of that particular lab assignment. So we're going to input a value, and then we're going to get the user to input a value, and then we're going to set dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And by the way, those are all return values, and they have to be separated by commas. They will be to the left-hand side of a single equal sign, to the right-hand side of a single equal sign. There's going to be the function call to exact change with that user input. And then I'm going to take and do the remainder of this is printing out whether it's a single dollar or multiple dollars and then the value, and single quarter or multiple quarters and then the value. That is exactly the same as the lab for module three. So again, don't start from scratch. If you did well on that, or close to well on that, start there. And then use that by just taking those calculations and making a function out of them. Make sure that you indent everything properly, and then you can return the values. Ooh, excuse me. OK. Is that all of them? Yeah, that was it. So, hope I didn't go too fast. Um, does anybody have any questions? Can you go over the return function just a little bit more? Because it's <clears throat> yeah. function, functions are still a bit cloudy for me, so I'm trying to wrap my brain around, uh, around it all. Is there any particular part that's cloudy or is it the entire kind of concept? No, I get the concept, but like basically when, so I give you a user return when you want to like, I guess, know the value of, ver of, the, of a variable in the local scope, correct? Um, yes. So um, here's one called split check. This is challenge 5.13.2. So a lot of what happens when we're coding is we're trying to encapsulate code that has um, that needs to be done together for a specific calculation or outcome. So let's say if you were playing a game and you move right, you you know get a magic wand and you can use a spell. And if you move left, you get a, a a jug of water and someone pours it over your head. Those are two separate, completely separate things that you might use a function for. You might define a function that says wand and spell if you move to the right and if you move to the left, you know, you might define a function that says cold water over the head. And if you move to the right in this particular way, Every single, you know, every single time it's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to pour water over your head. And if you move, sorry, so what should I say? Left. It'll move, it'll pour water over your head. Right, you know, you'll get your little wand and you'll be able to do your spell. So you want to be able to repeat those whenever somebody 
you know, turns right in a game or somebody turns left in a game. Those would be two probably complex calculations that you would want to split off into functions. And, and um, to simplify it down, if we look at the challenge in front of us, this is split check. So this is just a function that says, let's split the check. So we've got the bill, we've got the number of people, we've got the tax percentage, and we've got the tip percentage. And I want to be able to split the check. Let's say this is a little calcula calculator I've created for my phone or something. And I want to be able to just put that information in and split the same check the same way every time. So how do I do that? Well, for Python, I write a function. And this function is a good example because it has some of the more complex stuff in it. So I have a function called split check. I've got a bill, whatever my bill is going to be. I've got some number of people. I've got tax that I unfortunately have to pay. And I have a tip that I'm, just, I'm going to pay. So I calculate the tax, I calculate the tip, and then I calculate the whole total. And I divide it by the number of people. And I return the amount per diner, per person. So this is something that you might use again and again and again. Um, and all of this has to do with the same subject. It has to do with how do you split the check. And then I can return the amount that I calculated. So I don't have to have this all over the place. I can have it in one place and I can call it again and again. Now one of the things we haven't talked a lot about, we talk a little bit about it next week, is the concept of modules. There's our modules in Python that are basically just big libraries of functions that allow you to do all kinds of things, including program your own games, including build websites, um, ma highly complex mathematical. They've got stuff for environmental engineering, all kinds of things. So being able to take some functionality and put it into a function allows you to build up these libraries that do very specific things. Um, returns. So let's look at this return statement real quick. I am returning amount per diner. Amount per diner is calculated in this function. It is a local variable. I know it's a local variable, just like all other local variables. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Um, on the right-hand side is my calculation. And I've got three other variables here that I do calculations for. I have done the calculation completely within the local scope of the split check function. And so I want to I want to know what that value is. Maybe I want to display it to my screen or show my show it to my friends somehow. To do that, I have to get it out of the local scope. And and there's no way to do that other than using the return function. So, how about we run through this and by the way, Stop me if this is not what the questions that are going on in your head. So this okay, is yeah no th this is good but I think the biggest part for me I was I'm just trying to separate it between when you use return versus actually calling the function. Okay, so you call the function when you want to have something done. The return is, a, is something that can be done from a function, but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to return from a function. So in this case, I'm going to call the function here so that I can get the cost per diner out of it. Does that help? Right, yes, that okay. does. So you basically you want, you want what that total is before you actually call 
the entire function, which will let you know how much will be split. Yeah, I want I want to call split check to tell me how much each person's going to owe. Right. That's the job of split check. And right. I want to, so let's say that I have the bill, which is going to be 25, and I have three people. So XXX is not defined. Hold on. 5.3.2, where's XXX? Okay, let's stop this. Cost per diner. I know I interrupted it. 5.13.2, why did it tell me XXX wasn't defined? Is there XXX in here somewhere? I don't see XXX. Let's try it again. So let's say I've got a $25 bill and I'm dividing it by three people. Name error XXX is not defined. It's not there. I don't know what's wrong with this. I did that. step into it. Okay, I don't know why it's telling me this thing about XXX, but I'm not going to worry about it. Because it's not in there. I don't know why my thing is doing it. Anyway, so I've called, let me start again and ignore that. Okay. Mm. Oh, I see what's going on. My bad. So now I'm going to do it and then put everything in. So I've got 25 people. I um, so I've got 25 dollars, three people. Okay, we're going to step into this. I'm going to calculate the tax percentage. Of the tax, I'm going to calculate the tip, and I'm going to calculate the bill total. And now I'm count calculating the amount per diner, which is 10.3333. So now I want to use this amount later on that, that's not in this function. So the question is, how do I get this, this value that I've just calculated out of this function so it's usable someplace else? I do that for the return statement. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. And right now what it's doing is just going to print it out. So I'm going to print cost per diner. Now there's another way I could do this that's a little more explicit. I can say I can define a variable called cost per diner and I can have it I can set it to the return value of split check and I can use cost per diner here. So this will make it a little more explicit. You can see that you are setting a variable to the outcome of this function call. So and this is more. a variable. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. One more question. So why do you like print it and then call the function at, at, and like in tandem as well? Um, it's just shorthand. It's just okay. another way of doing things. They're both equally as valid. Gotcha. Okay. Sometimes um, Sometimes people want to do it like this and it's fine, and sometimes people want to do it the other way, and that's just fine too. Right, okay. Um, when you have larger complex problems, I tend to prefer, because I like using the debugger, 
I tend to prefer to do things on separate lines so I can actually see what the debugger is doing, especially when they're really complex and I'm having to run through them a couple of times. Um, so they're equally as valid. Some people will say, oh, you should never do that. The truth of the matter is computers are so fast, you aren't actually causing it to do any more work by doing it this way than by doing it with just split check called here. Right. So, and most of when this is, this is run in the interpreter, it's probably going to squash those back to one anyway if it doesn't need to have them as separate lines. So basically print and then cost per diner and then cost, like that is just as valid as if you just did split check. Yeah. Like the, okay, gotcha. It'll get you the same outcome. Okay, understood. It's, it's um, some people prefer to do it the shorthand way, and if it, there are times when I will, and there are times when I won't. It just depends on what I'm doing at the time and how complex it is. Right. And most interpreters and compilers now have what they call optimizers in them, and it optimizes the bytecode. It's gonna, it may squash it anyway. It may put those into a single line when it's translating this into bytecode. Right, okay. So does this help you a little bit, Jordan? Yes, it does. I appreciate it. Okay. Do you think you're prepared to do some of the labs from this week and the project? Well, yes, I've already started on both. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I've got, um, I have, I would say, my pseudocode written probably three-fourths of the way. Okay. Um, I just still need to, like, I think I need to make parts of it a little bit more concise. Okay. But it's coming along. The good. labs are a little difficult, so but this helps, so I'm going to spend tomorrow working on those. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Okay. Going once, going twice. Um, I'm going to stop.